are going to start with um, a welcome speech by um, Dr. S um, Saeed, without whose help, encouragement, and support, this conference would not have been possible. So thank you very much, Dr. Saeed and Mara, for all, for your, all your help and support. Um, we shall then proceed with two panels, each consisting of three speakers. And at the end of each panel, we will open um, you know, the floor up to Q&A, with the exception of Dr. Diwan, who has to leave due to um, time constraint. So when Dr. Diwan is done with her presentation, then you can um, you know, um, ask questions um, because she has to leave. But for the other speakers, we will wait till each panel is completed. <coughs> Um, for many of you, Dr. Said does not need any introduction, but for those of you who do not know him, he is a senior ranking professor at American University and the first occupant of the endowed Muhammad Said Farsi Chair of Islamic Peace. He founded the university-wide Center for Global Peace, um, which undertakes a, a wide range of activities, both on campus and off, off campus, aimed at advancing our, our understanding of world peace, and we are honored to have him here. So without further ado, um, Dr. Said, would you like to take the podium? Welcome, welcome. Good to see old friends and colleagues and to make new friends. As a field of academic study, peace and conclusion go together. When peace was defined narrowly as <coughs> the absence of war, the separation between peace and conclusion may have been defensible. Now, as we have accepted the broader definition of peace to include social justice, ecological sustainability, sustainable economics, and cultural diversity. Peace as the absence of sexual violence, Confusion is one of the building blocks of peace. So what we are talking about today is really a building block for all of us. Context and content in the study of peace and conflict resolution <coughs> also go together. The ends we seek and the means we employ, employ in the study of peace and conflict resolution are interconnected. The ends are present in the means through which they are pursued. Peace and conflict resolution and education if it is to be effective, must employ a pedagogy that is itself peace. Education about peace and conflict resolution and education for peace and conflict resolution are two sides of the same coin. Peace and conflict resolution education combines information and liberation and procedure for transformation. We need to reconceptualize peace. So peace education is really liberation. We have to liberate ourselves to be able to involve involved in peace education. <coughs> there are basic principles underlying the study of peace and conflict resolution. One, epistemological principles, principles certain epistemological principles. By that, I mean unity of analytical and intuitive modes of consciousness. Intuition provides us with meaningful points of departure and suggests important interrelationships and paths of investigation. Analytical thinking enables us to make tight sequential connections. So we need both in peace education. Uh, another principle is unity of theory and practice. The process of knowing must always involve the transformation of the knowing subject 
and the world through meaningful action. Theoretical and abstract knowledge are e complemented by experiment and experience, both in the classroom <coughs> and out of the classroom. Another principle, the union of knower, knower and known. Knowledge is built in the relationship between us and our surroundings. Because we are part of the system we study, learning requires that we analyze our experiences, assess our conditioning and core beliefs, and explore the relation between knower and known. With the help of self-knowledge, we refine our own understanding and learn about the world. Earnestness, openness, and concern for the clear communication of ideas are better guarantors of academic integrity than rhetoric about objectivity, which can encourage competitive monologues, egotism, incivility, rather than dialogue and understanding. Another principle, in integral, synthetic, and humanistic approach to knowing new, new insights and connections arise through a willingness to entertain multiple perspectives. So we have to see things from as many perspectives as we can. Seeing through more than one lens trains the mind to be nimble, capable of finding common ground and making new connections. This includes common concern for appropriate methodology. Both quantitative and qualitative modes of inquiry are useful. A tendency to avoid necessary either or, or dichotomies is desirable. Learning involves both analytic and moetic processes. Be willing to move from truth to truth. The whole is reflected in the past, and from the past comes the ever greater whole. Pedagogical principles. Problem-centered. Our, our, our work has to be problem-centered. The context of education must spring from the learners themselves and their relations with each other and the world. Allotting time for the discussion of current events in class is one way. We relate text to the everyday context and substance of politics. A dialectic process which joins actions and reflections in the classroom, the diverse experiences of students become resources for learning. Uh, in the classroom, it's not only the instructor who is the source of knowing, but it is all of us working together. Dialogue, conclusion must be dialogical in nature and in practice. The primary methods, methodology of conclusion must be dialogue based on mutual respect. Among the teacher and the students, the classroom can become a forum. Skills of clear communication and active listening can be developed. Empowerment, another principle. The teacher should not impose a hegemonic theory or over-socialize with students and should encourage and recognize creativity and new insights while respecting intuitive perceptions as points of departure for integrity. The teacher must keep his or her ego in check. Education for peace and construction requires a respect for human dignity both inside and outside the walls of the classroom, encourage students to see themselves as co-learners and co-creators. Another principle, the context of peace and conflict, the context. Interdisciplinary nature of peace and conflict, it is interdisciplinary, it involves communication, international relations, political science, sociology, anthropology, psychology. It has to be multidisciplinary looking at what's happening in and in business schools, looking, uh, looking at conclusion in terms of civil society, civic education, rewriting texts, promoting democratic cultures, building political cultures that are tolerant, transnational relations and track to diplomacy. 
we need a big enough view of the world in order to relate to our human beings, the ostensible goals of conflict resolution and peace studies, we must be able to interrelate and extrapolate between different ways of knowing. Cultural empathy is essential. It's essential. Yeah. But under developed skill, which must be developed, it is really essential. Yeah. It is a skill that we have to develop more. Cultural empathy. Yeah. And in conclusion, I'm reminded of Hassan Fathi. Uh, if you have not read Hassan Fathi, half of your life is wasted. Hassan Fathi, a magnificent Egyptian architect in the 20th century. Uh, and uh, I am gleaning from his principles of architecture, principles to peace education. One principle he talks about, belief in the primar primacy of, of human values in designing social space. He said, in designing social space, you have to base them on human ground, all education in a guiding ethical order. This means ensuring that there is first and foremost no relative deprivation based on, upon class, gender, ethnicity, or religion in the classroom, and opening up a public space for rediscovering the applicability of past experiences and values to the present. Yeah. Learned that from sitting with them many, many times in Egypt. Another principle, a universal than a, a, rather than a limited approach to solving social problems. I will repeat that again. A universal rather than a limited approach to solving social problems. Meaning avoiding the arrogance of ideological dogma or the educational methodolog methodologies in the East, which is rote learning, and the West, which is standardized testing that limit open process-oriented dialogue in the classroom. I agree with him. He's, both of them are harmful. Another principle, the importance of community and socially oriented education techniques. I will repeat that again, the importance of community and social socially oriented education techniques, meaning the search for truth and meaning must seek to understand the best each culture has to offer. It's my belief, based on my experience, that every culture has a great deal to offer to all of us. At the same time, seeking knowledge forms knowledge from communities so we must embrace and acknowledge the knowledge communities we construct. Another principle, the importance of reestablishing pride and dignity through social development. We must acknowledge the worth of every individual and their perspective in their classrooms, as well as taking the time to acknowledge that poverty is more than material deprivation. Poverty represents a condition in which your dignity has been removed, and traditional ways of knowing are viewed as antithetical to modern progress. Nonsense. They are not antithetical, antithetical to progress. And traditional ways of knowing are viewed as, yeah, instead of defining society in opposition, modern versus pre-modern, the education system should seek to critically engage local as well as global traditions. You are very welcome and you have our best wishes for the experience today. Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce to you the first speaker on our first panel, um, Dr. Kristen Duan. Um, Dr. Duan is an assistant professor of comparative and regional studies at the American University School of International Service, as well as the coordinator for Middle East Studies she is part of the Faculty Advisory Committee, Center for Democracy and Election Management, and a non-resident fellow at the Rafiq Hariri Center for Middle East um, Atlantic Council. So, Dr. Diwan. Thank you. Is this on already? Yes. Hear me? Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank first uh, Professor Abdelaziz Saeed, who uh, every time I hear Dr. Saeed speak, it, it brings something new to my mind and gives me something I want to go look at further. So thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank the people of Shia Rights Watch for um, organizing this panel and initiating this and bringing us all together. And I want to take the time to welcome all of you as well to American University. Um, and I'm very glad to be here with you. Um, I've been asked to speak about the situation of the Shia in the Arab Gulf or of the Gulf Cooperation Council states. Um, and Dr. Said spoke about the need to approach these complicated issues from a multidisciplinary approach. Um, I'm definitely going to be contributing things from my own perspective, which is as a political scientist. So I can't really help but put a, a political frame and context um, around the challenges that we see today. Um, and I think actually that's pretty useful though, um, because as we look, I think we have to acknowledge that as we try to move towards a period right now where we can find greater enlightenment, where we can find the space for education and for more dialogue and mutual understanding between um, Sunni and Shia in particular, or all sects within the Middle East, um, that we're facing a really difficult and challenging uh, time right now. Uh, the political context is not very favorable for these things. Um, but what I want to do with my comments with you today, I, I'm really just going to be putting pr uh, political context, but the goal of, of doing this um, is really to show that the, the kind of sectarian strife that we're seeing uh, really increasing very much in the world today is not something at all that's immutable or that's necessary, um, and that it's really shaped by, by political context. Um, and if we look, um, initially what I'm going to be talking about are, are different processes of state formation that bring, that, that uh, set the way in which different communities are, are brought within the state. Or if we look at different choices that governments make over time, they really do affect the, the ability for people to come together or to, to bring people apart. Um, so my initial remarks then, I, I want to just be looking at uh, some of the diversity that we find within the Gulf Cooperation Council states. Uh, in terms of, of how um, Shia communities have been brought or integrated into the state. And I want to show that this really is uh, shaped and formed um, by the process of state formation, which differs in each of these states. So just to give a few examples, if, if you look at uh, the state of Saudi Arabia, um, this was a state that was formed um, as kind of a pact between a tribal elite, the Al Saud, and a puritanical revivalist movement um, based on the tenets of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Um, and so the very kind of nature of the way that the state was brought together and the, the pivotal role that, that Wahhabism has played is almost like a state ideology within the state uh, definitely makes it much more difficult for, for the Shia within Saudi Arabia to receive equal treatment from the state or even equal consideration uh, within the community in Saudi Arabia from their fellow uh, citizens. Um, if you contrast that with the position of a state like Kuwait, which is in many ways a, a merchant republic, um, this is a state where Shia have been historically very close to the ruling family, and they formed a really important part <coughs> of the merchants that were integral to the founding of the state, and were even found themselves sort of inside the wall in this really pivotal uh, kind of uh, national moment in Kuwait, in this battle where the, the Kuwaitis were able to sort of defend themselves against sort of attack from from uh, forces coming from Saudi Arabia that really secured the independence of the state, so which really gives them kind of a, a deeper sense of membership uh, within that state and gives different uh, potential sort of for cross-sectarian uh, uh, interactions and, and even citizenship within the Kuwait. Um, if we look at the state of Bahrain, again, the circumstances are, are different even again. Um, the ruling family in Bahrain, the Al Khalifa, arrived on the island in the late 1700s um, as a conquering force. Uh, they and their allies, who originally came from the Najd region of Saudi Arabia, uh, were tribal and, and established basically a, a feudal state over the existing population, which was sedentary and were, were peasants, um, mostly. Um, and this obviously changed over time as the modern state was formed, and you had um, the urban centers really developing, and, and, and Bahrain also becoming a really important commercial and colonial center, which brought in a lot of uh, Shia as well from you know, Persians coming from Iran. Um, and other Shia became really important merchant elites. But I'd say that the, um, the founding sort of condition uh, within the state still um, means that the, a lot of Shia, and particularly the Shia from these villages, the native population, sort of lagged behind in a lot of the development of the state. Um, 
there's some books, I mean, you can look at the research. Even in the 1970s, there were much less uh, literacy in, within this community. Um, and the sort of opportunities for them were different. Um, and so that the kind of integration wa was an even within the state as well. And also meant that religious leaders then also played a, a really important role um, in leading these communities um, and sort of protecting them throughout time. Sure. <coughs> And it also meant the, the kind of exclusion or the, the failure of sort of full integration within the state meant that it left uh, communities also very uh, open to revolutionary messages that came from Iran. Um, and that found some reception uh, in Bahrain in the 1970s, late 1970s, 1980s. So I, I really just give you this really cursory sketch just to show you that there's, there's quite a bit of difference in the political situation of Shia from, from the very founding of the state that, that conditions there, the potentialities in these states. Um, there's also differences though, if you look just within one state over time, um, that comes about from different uh, political circumstances and also different choices that are made by leaders. Um, and I'll just use uh, Bahrain as an example of this. Um, and we can really see the monarchy uh, making different choices over time. Um, so that we have in Bahrain, um, really every 10 years or so through the failure really of the state to, to integrate any of its citizens is fully uh, within the country um, uh, and to really impose a, a degree of accountability on the ruling family. We've had uprisings ha happening quite frequently in Bahrain. Um, and in the 1990s, early 2000s, then we saw the, the new king uh, taking initiatives uh, to reform the state and to uh, reinstate the parliament. Um, and this did, and as well, to, to create a, a new sort of economic dynamic that would allow for the, the Shia to, to come back from exile out of the, the opposition, to come back from exile and to play a bigger role uh, within the state, both politically <coughs> and economically. Um, this was a very incomplete process. Uh, the new parliament that was reinstated uh, was not fully democratic in the sense that there was also an upper uh, house that was imposed, a, a Shura council that was non-elected, which had a lot of power over the elected body. There was also a lot of gerrymandering that, that didn't allow for, for full representation or um, and allow particularly the Shia majority to ever take a majority within the parliament. And we also had processes of, of naturalization uh, particularly from, from uh, Sunnis that were, uh, ha have actually had the impact of shifting the demographic balance uh, within the state. Um, but there was at least at that time some space uh, for more interaction of people within society, more space for Shia to take place in the economy and also in the politics of the state. Um, as we see though over time though, that this, this really has changed and has shifted. Um, I think a, a big factor in this, just to show the impact that that external kind of crises can have on a state happened after the US intervention in Iraq, uh, when we saw kind of Shia communities elevated to power there and the greater influence uh, or fear, at least within Gulf Cooperation Council states, the, of what Iran would play in the region. Uh, we saw a lot of fear in Bahrain about what that might mean for this island nation and some within the ruling family uh, started to think that, or maybe always thought, but they got elevated and kind of found more uh, receptivity to their thinking that uh, empowering Shia in any means uh, within the political system or in the economic system was really not a good idea. And so we saw a lot of efforts to kind of push Shia more out of this earlier framework. Um, and this became very apparent then uh, when the Arab uh, uprisings happened, um, when we saw a lot of receptivity, I mean, within the population in Bahrain, <coughs> the initial call uh, for greater accountability and for more democracy. And uh, when the uprising took place, uh, then we saw the, through the uprising, and especially through a, a Saudi intervention, um, the ability of these hardliners within the ruling family to really take a leading role. And it's really changed the, the environment in, in Bahrain tremendously. Um, we've seen a really a, a huge separation in, in communities, much less space to find understanding between Sia, uh, Sunni and Shia within the state. Uh, we've seen a really permissive environment for more sectarian language, wholesale firing of Shia from, from jobs, um, and also even the destruction of some Shia mosque, which is an injection of a new kind of ideological sectarianism that you really didn't have present uh, in Bahrain up until that time. So um, this is just kind of a, a cursory view again, but I, I give it to you to show you that that um, really the um, that these things aren't immutable, 
that political situations and conditions really change and affect these things. Um, and so things can change with different political choices. Um, and I think uh, as well that it also means that we, we need to acknowledge that while we had the early promise uh, of the Arab Spring, which was really based, I think, on um, an appeal for people to, to find the space to force more accountability on governments, to find a more um, uh, space for, for uh, citizenship, really, for an independent way for, for citizens to, to both force, enforce accountability and to have pr um, political participation and really have more say in their governments. Um, as we see this really uh, not going so well <laughs> in many of the, the states uh, throughout the Arab world, and we see really then this failure of a full integration of people more fairly within their states, um, we're going to face uh, really much greater challenges, um, <coughs> particularly with the conflict that's happening in, in Syria, which is um, kind of drawing in s and, and amplifying some of the worst sort of sectarian thinking um, in the region. Um, and also there's just the weakening of states, the inability of them to do that um, as a force that's really making the, the space for the kind of things that Dr. Abdelaziz was talking about more difficult. So, um, like I mentioned, doc, um, Dr. Duan has to leave, so if anyone has any questions, I think Dr. Saeed had. Yes, Dr. Duan, yesterday I received a telephone call mm -hmm. uh, from a prison in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I received a telephone call from a prison in Bahrain. <coughs> uh, the lady on the telephone, she said, I'm standing out of the prison, I'm the wife of Nabil Rajab. Mm. Yeah. Nabil Rajab is a human rights activist. Uh, and have been in prison now for a while, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then I had, I had the time to speak with him, and he said, we need your help, all of you. So how can we, what, what can we do, those of us who are committed, as you are, mm -hmm. to the protection, advancement of human <laughs> rights in Bahrain? Right. Mm. Um, yeah, that, I mean, this is a really unfortunate case and, and kind of exemplar. If we look at kind of the where Shia were going prior, prior to this uprising, actually even uh, increased through this uprising, there'd be an, a much more um, stronger emphasis on a rights-based language, um, on people demanding their rights from these states, and uh, Nabil Rajab was really at the front line of that uh, through the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, really pushing and, and making a kind of a rights-based language and approaching the states. Um, it's really hard to say in, the, in these difficult, you know, kind of circumstances. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I'm not an activist. But I, th I think definitely one thing that's really important is just to be honest about what is happening. Um, and I think as, as far as government policy, just to clearly state what is happening and not kind of sugarcoat it um, and be aware of those things and to stand up for the basic human values that you've, you've talked about. I mean, I think... Um, facilitating both uh, the understanding about the rights of all people, how they should all be represented within these communities, and encouraging those policies and actions where, where we can find through, through people of goodwill who are doing those activities. Yeah, I think we have a question there if you would like to pass the mic. Yeah. Well, um, my name is uh, Abby Jollis. I'm an international human rights litigator, and I wanted to respond to your question about uh, Nabil Rajab. He's been locked up, it's true, for uh, some years. Uh, I don't know if uh, folks know, but the United States Congress um, uh, has an adoption program. And they put what they call prisoners of conscience. They, each congressman adopts them. Uh, Nabil Rajab has been uh, adopted by Congressman McGovern of uh, Massachusetts. And I, I, I now know that he is eligible uh, for parole based on good behavior. He's been locked up, I think, uh, about three years now. Um, and every day uh, he's becoming more and more popular. So uh, I had, uh, I just came back from a conference uh, uh, who I was privileged to attend with uh, Mustafa here, who's the uh, head of this group. And I, uh, I had meant to call Congressman McGovern and explain that, in fact, uh, Nabil Rajab now is eligible uh, for release based on good behavior. So with respect to Nabil Rajab, I think uh, I'm optimistic that we're going to see he's going to, to come out soon. Now, they've got more <coughs> than 3,000 others. 
Uh, so it's uh, it's a it's a big it's a big problem. But uh, uh, but I think uh, this is a very very good program that Congress has. It's bipartisan, uh, and it's and it's important. And people don't seem to really know about it. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true too. <laughs> just to really quickly, just to add to that as well. I mean, actually, Congress has been a really big. Uh, source of a pressure point on Bahrain. Um, and I think that's important because the US government has had a really kind of a split personality on Bahrain. It's not taken a really strong position. I think there's also, I mean, the, the Department of Defense has their own kind of perspective on Bahrain, uh, having the naval base based there and the kind of interest that they see in the states, which gives them a certain perspective on the country. Um, but I think the the some Congressional members, um, in particular, and, and senators, I know Marco Rubio has been actually been very uh, active on the Bahrain issue as well. Um, have a broader issue about this in terms of kind of democratic empowerment, um, and have been uh, open to using different, I mean, instruments that are available already on the ground. Like I know the free trade agreement that Bahrain is committed to with the United States, and some of the firings that have taken place in Bahrain. Um, some of the uh, labor groups have been looking at these and seeing if these violate sort of the free trade agreement and just using that as a point of conversation with Bahrain to try to persuade the government to go in a different direction. Um, I think Dr. Sajdina here, and then there's the, the lady at the back. Well, thank you very much for your uh, analysis. I have, uh, since I actively work in the field, so I'm an activist academician mm -hmm. who's interested in the promotion of the human rights. And my experience in the field is that uh, I lectured in Bahrain in 2006 for 15 days. I was there. And um, the frustration is our government's foreign policy, mm -hmm. which does not put the pressure where it is needed, despite the human rights watch and its analysis of the situation. We are not able to put the pressure on the ruling house mm -hmm. because Saudi Arabia is not approving that. So we are really caught into a very serious moral situation. On the one hand, we want to say that we are promoting human rights. And when it comes to the actual cases of violation of human rights, and we know exactly where the pressure should be put we're somehow saying, the White House says, we will not do it because this is not what Saudi Arabia wants. Mm -hmm. And then we don't like Iran, so Iran's influence is negative. So we are weighing international relations in terms of the power politics mm -hmm. and exactly where do we then stand when it comes to our own position, which is very principled one, by the way, mm -hmm. that we want to see promotion of human rights. Especially, we are talking about the justice towards the Shia majority in Bahrain. We have not been able to do anything in the last five, six years. We have been getting reports after reports. One or two individuals are, you know, set free or, you know, are under our <coughs> some kind of, you know, watch, human rights watch, are able to do. But our government here is not able to put the pressure where it is needed to be put. Mm -hmm. How do we resolve that kind of paradox? Mm -hmm between our high goals and moral principles and the way we are actually, you know, carrying it out in the application. Yeah. I mean, I think it is actually a difficult situation in Bahrain. I mean, it's, it's even more complicated and more difficult by, by the fact that I think those within the ruling family, by these really important splits within the ruling family, and those within the ruling family that are at least more receptive to that sort of pressure and, and at least more open to, um, championing sort of dialogue and pulling back from the direction that Bahrain has gone in in, in the past couple of years um, are also those people that are most dependent on U.S. engagement. So it's this sort of difficult situation where if the U.S. Uh, takes a position of, of uh, threatening sort of non-engagement or pulling back or pulling away, we actually weaken those people that we most want to help and leave uh, a, a more broader hand and increase the dependence of Bahrain on Saudi Arabia, which I think ultimately probably doesn't uh, leave the kind of space that we need to, to find a broader political solution within Bahrain. So it is a really difficult uh, position. I, I mean, I think some of the early hope came uh, with the opening that came from the Bahrain uh, Basiuni report, the, the commission, this uh, human rights uh, 
uh, lawyer who came in and, and did do a really good job of kind of just outlining what happened uh, on the ground in Bahrain uh, during the uprising and its aftermath and um, really showing, I, I think, uh, clearly uh, um, a lot of the problems that, that took place from the government, uh, the deaths that, that were done at the hands of the government, and even outlined torture that happened uh, in the prisons in Bahrain. Uh, but unfortunately, they haven't been able to force the kind of reforms that the, the report called for or even to enforce accountability. So, But that still remains there. That report is there, and the, and the um, suggestions that came from the report are, are still there. So that's probably another avenue for kind of pushing for those things just to be respected since the Bahrain government has already accepted that report. Thank you for having this panel. Um, I'm Giselle Lopez, I'm a student here, and um, I'm also the president of Creative Peace Initiatives. Um, and I just wanted to mention, for those of you who don't know, um, this is an especially relevant um, panel discussion and event to have, um, and it's, it, uh, it's, it's um, it very extra important to have Shia Rights Watch um, sponsor an event here, um, particularly because there is a strong connection between the um, School of International Service and the ruling family in Bahrain. So we started an initiative to raise awareness about these rights. And when you, when you ask, you know, what can we do um, about the fact that the U.S. government has not acted on these issues, um, given the strong strategic influence? Um, so just to, to mention that, so that that's in your, you know, in your mind. Um, the the atrium is named after the Crown Prince um, Salman um, of Bahrain. So. Um, you'll see his, his name on our atrium if you walk outside up the stairs. Um, so I think, I think targeting sort of the PR regime that's here in D.C. is one way to at least make a dent in that, um, the ongoing human rights violations and the fact that the, one of the, the main human rights activists who's known internationally, respected internationally, is still in prison. Um, and Professor Yuan, I wanted to ask you, um, you speak about um, reforms that can incorporate the Shia communities, um, <coughs> given that there is sort of a new, um, the Crown Prince just initiated a new, um, a new round of dialogues. Um, mm -hmm. And given that you know a lot of the people that need to be part of these dialogues are not, are still in prison, um, what do you feel is most important um, to be addressed in those dialogues, and what? can be done here in D.C. in bridging the gaps between communities outside of Bahrain, here in D.C., and, and in, in Europe, and outside of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you, Giselle. Um, yeah, as Giselle mentioned, uh, there have been attempts, sort of a, a dialogue initiated uh, by the state in Bahrain. Um, I, I think most of the people within the Bahraini opposition don't feel that those have reached the level of, of really seriousness, um, both the initial dialogue where the opposition was really marginalized within a much kind of larger selection of people um, that was were included in the initial dialogue, and, and the current dialogue, which um, never really was able to find uh, e even a, a mode of understanding of how they were supposed to proceed. Um, that one had just, just collapsed when the Crown Prince came in, um, and it was significant that he did intervene because this was the first time uh, that the Crown Prince had agreed to meet with the Shia Islamist opposition, Al Wifaq, directly. He met with Sheikh Ali Salman, and this came at a time when really Al Wifaq, the hardliners when the government, were starting to actually arrest some people in the main Shia Islamist opposition. and. Um, and even uh, there's still actually cases out uh, against them. So look at there might be going a much further um, uh, to a much more, e even more extensive political crackdown. So that was significant that the Crown Prince stepped in at that time. Um, however, he since stepped back. <laughs> and I think most people feel that the that currently um, the hardliners are once again sort of uh, directing things on, on the current dialogue and that there's not uh, a lot of optimism, I guess, for, for where that will be going. Um, I think one thing that, I, I, like I said, I think the, the Bassini report was an important report. Um, but one thing that I, I find frustrating about the report is that it really turned uh, a lot of the conversation about issues uh, like security reform, police reform, these sorts of things, which are very important in Bahrain. I mean, for those of you who don't know, the, the security forces in Bahrain are uh, largely made up of non-Bahrainis. 
um, a, a large sector of them, and she are not permitted, uh, for the most part, in, in a lot of the uh, security forces or defense forces of the country. Um, so we definitely need a, a lot of uh, security reform, but it really turned away from the key issues that were the initial demands of the uprising, which were political reform. Um, and I think it's really critical that uh, the Bahraini government and that the U.S. government pushes to the extent that it can. This issue of, again, political reform, I mean, actually addressing these issues of gerrymandered districts, of the inequality between um, sort of the elected council of representatives and the unelected Shura council, um, and really just pushing Bahrainis to, again, take up these political issues. Because the problem is now, without any progress on the political front, um, it is true that uh, things are getting much more dangerous. We've had people actually persisting in protests for three years, which is quite astounding, actually. Um, just says something for uh, the opposition that they've been able to sustain these protests for that long. At the same time, uh, since the government has succeeded in really pushing the protests out of sort of a main square where it could kind of pull in a lot of people who are sympathetic maybe to a cause of reform and really push them back sort of into these Shia villages where they've been able to contain <coughs> them, I think it's much harder for those protests to gain any sort of broader uh, national support that they need. Um, and in fact, it's kind of daily, uh, you know, contest that's taking place between security forces um, that are really kind of suffocating these villages and the use of tear gas and all of these things is, are pushing some within um, the opposition uh, now to take up uh, more violence, Molotov cocktails, and we've even had a small improvised, improvised vices. So it's really important, I think, that, that Bahrain get back on track with a, a political dialogue. A political dialogue is really needed then to allow for the kind of uh, conversation that could take place to open the space for people of goodwill who really want to bring the two communities together and to really pull back the initiative from, from hardliners in the state. Um, the microphone, please, right here. Uh, I'm Hora with Shia Rights Watch. My question is like very simple and basic, but I think it's a very important question. What do, th do you think is the motivation and reason for the uprising in Bahrain? Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm asking this question is that a lot of people believe that the uprising beca is because Shia are taking to take over the, the kingdom. But if we know that people are uprising and protesting because they just need basic rights, then we have a different approach uh, toward that uprise. So what do you think is the motivation behind the uprise? And hopefully, if we keep as activists, as academics, if we keep reminding people that the motivation is not to take over power, that hopefully we can have a change in the political view as well. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that, that certainly is the case, uh, particularly in the, the early days of the uprising, um, which did draw, uh, I mean, I know many people, I've, I've talked to many Bahrainis, many Sunni Bahrainis who also went to, to the Pearl Roundabout in the early days. I mean, we have to remember that the uprising started in Bahrain only three days after Mubarak stepped down from power in Egypt. There was really this surge of optimism across the Arab world that you could have this kind of move from below and grassroots politics that could lead to, you know, really citizen empowerment across the region. Um, I think it's important, though, also to acknowledge uh, that uh, kind of the, the actions by the government, uh, the violence that was used, um, um, really did push a lot of the opposition. A substantial part of the opposition is calling for the fall of the monarchy now. Uh, they're calling for the co fall of the monarchy um, under uh, calls for, for self-determination. Um, and democracy, um, but I think it does uh, make for a difficult situation in Bahrain because uh, uh, I think uh, through sort of a lot of the rhetoric and the sectarian rhetoric that was promoted by the government and through their really monopoly over the, the airwaves following the revolution, there's a lot of fear, um, and I think we need to acknowledge that um, in the Sunni, Sunni community. Um, a lot of resistance then, and even fear, I mean, even if you look at the main uh, Sunni Islamist opposition, they've clearly said that they're not even in favor of democracy because they know that democracy will mean empowerment ultimately of a, a Shia majority within the state. So I think that means that we need, uh, or the Bahrainis need to approach things with some creativity. 
um, and try to sort of uh, find ways that can reassure all members within the community while at the same time pressing forth the goal that I think would, would help all Bahrainis and I think that would get a majority of Bahrainis really on board for just greater issues of accountability of the ruling family. Uh, we have really extensive corruption that's coming out of there. Resource sharing is really sort of abysmal within the, within the government and that really came out much stronger during the kind of wealth boom that took place where we saw this kind of uh, uh, land use issues really being all out of whack within the country. Um, and just greater empowerment of, of citizens. But I, I think it would help to kind of think more creatively and, and to have the kind of outreach to coming from the Shia Islamist opposition, which they've been trying to do uh, to reassure the broader population. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more quick question, and then we have to really move on. And I think the gentleman at the front here. Thank you for taking my question. And my name is Kiyan Shahzari. I'm an attorney at law in Iran and human rights activist. And I had the chance to take two summer courses here in uh, this institute, so I'm glad to be here once more. My question is regarding the new approaches of uh, American government towards its foreign policy regarding Iran, because we, we are hearing, you know, some new voices from Iranian government, and it seems that the nuclear issue with Iran is going to be solved within a few months. And of course, there are so many problems from both sides. Hardliners in Iran are against such a deal. And here in the United States, even we uh, see many uh, problems, uh, especially in Congress and so on. But generally, I think that there is really a great chance for a kind of normalization in relations between Iran and the United States. So how do you evaluate the impact of uh, such a deal or such a normalization mm -hmm. on the situation of human rights of Shia people in Persian Gulf region? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with you in identifying this issue. I think this is one area where we can really look to with some, some optimism. Um, I don't want to overestimate it. I think you've described it quite well, that there are plenty of people both in the United States and also in Iran that, that don't want to see this deal go forward. Um, uh, and I think it's difficult to find a, a position that will make all of the main stakeholders feel comfortable with moving forward. Um, but I think um, this could be, could be an important breakthrough. Um, we know that if we look across the region, one of the main drivers of kind of this really uh, worsening relations between Sunni and Shia communities is the kind of elevation and I guess what we could by now call a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, those sort of power dynamics have been uh, really corrosive, I think, across the region. Um, so I guess there's some hope that this could be sort of an initial um, uh, path that could empower, as you say, sort of moderates within both. Um, we, we've seen uh, the Iranian government, I know at least in the countries that I pay the most attention to in the Gulf states, kind of doing a, an initiative to kind of reach out to Gulf states to reassure them. I don't think it's working <laughs> for the most part. I mean, we've seen some positive reception. Um, but I will say that I think for, for it to really have the positive effects, we would have to see it move beyond just the nuclear issue um, to see some goodwill both from the Iranian government um, as well as from the Saudi government uh, in a number of different uh, avenues where, which are real flashpoints between Sunni and Shia. I mean, the biggest of them obviously being Syria. Um, but we also see these flashpoints emerging in Bahrain and also in Yemen and other places. So um, I think it's, it's going to be really important this goes forward, that this will be an important opening that may lead away to, to um, uh, kind of more moderates and more moderating policies. But it will also still be really important to, to not leave it just at that and to actually start to address the global conflict that's taking place that's uh, worsening these local, what are essentially local conflicts, I think, across the region. 
I do apologize that I cannot take any more questions, but we have to move on. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Dinan, um, for a very informative contribution, and thank you, everybody, for your input and your questions. Um, I'd like to now move on to our um, second speaker on our panel, Mr. Michael Kogelman, who is a Senior Program Associate for South and Southeast Asia at the Woodrow Wilson Center, where he is responsible for research, programming, and publication on South and Southeast Asia. His most recent work has focused on the Pakistani 2013 elections, and he has been extensively interviewed and quoted in media sources, both nationally and internationally. And I'll keep it brief because um, his accomplishments keep going on, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pass it on to Mr. Kugelman.